Mrs. Zupke here. We are looking at the kinetic theory of gases. We already did kinetic molecular theory where we looked at particles in solids, liquids, and gases and what makes them different. And now we're going to look specifically at gases. So we talked about how, what is the kinetic theory of gases, what does it talk about? Tiny particles in all forms of matter are in constant motion, okay? Gas is composed of particles, whether that be the example of air, which we've got hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, etc., or some other example. The point is that they're made of particles. Okay, they fill the space they're in. That supermarket example where we open up the helium tank, the helium's not going to stay above the tank. It's going to spread out into the whole supermarket. Um, what do we know about particles? In a gas, they move rapidly in constant random motion. Okay, that means that they're not going to follow the same path as another particle in the gas. Okay, they move in straight paths still, but they're independent of one another. They also change direction when they rebound from collisions, and this is random. So just because they bounce into each other from these directions means that they could bounce this way or this way or this way or whatever, but they're not necessarily um, going to go in an ordered fashion, so it's random. And then we have the fact that collisions are perfectly elastic, and this is really cool, that they don't lose any of the energy that they have when they initially bounce into one another. Which brings us to kinetic energy, which we want to think of as Ke, kinetic energy. So anytime you see Ke, think kinetic energy. And what was our keyword for this unit? Particles. Okay, so when particles bounce into one another, their collisions are perfectly elastic which means that that energy that the object had because of its motion, it doesn't lose any of it. It still has the same amount when it bounces away. All right, by now hopefully you've written down part two where we're looking at temperature. So what is it? In part one, we talked about the kinetic theory of gases and looking at kinetic energy, okay? Um, kinetic energy, what do we say? It was the energy of movement, so as particles move, we can actually measure that, and we measure that via temperature, so a thermometer, okay? Um, as molecules speed up or speed down, we can actually measure this. Things with increased kinetic energy have a higher temperature. Things with a decreased kinetic energy have a lower temperature, and we actually have something called absolute zero, Okay, absolute zero is a couple different measurements. We can call it negative 273 degrees Celsius. We can also call it zero Kelvin. It's like having Fahrenheit and Celsius, but in science we use Kelvin and Celsius. Americans are holdouts to keep using Fahrenheit, even though everybody else uses Celsius. And then scientists use Kelvin. Now, why? Why do scientists use Kelvin? Okay, if we look at and it might be backwards, I don't know what the video is going to do. If we look at a thermometer, okay, this is my really bad drawing, so don't laugh. You're going to laugh anyway. Okay, here's my thermometer, okay? We've got, how are we doing? There we go. We've got the Kelvin side and the Celsius side, okay? On the Kelvin side, I have zero Kelvin. Now, that's the coldest anything can get. What is absolute zero? It's the point at which, theoretically, Particles stop moving. You're like, really? Basically, they slow them down enough that they actually stop moving. It's really, really cool. Why is it theoretically? Because we haven't been able to do it. And we might not ever be able to do it. Um, the reason that scientists use Kelvin is because then you can never have a zero value. If you're ever doing math, what happens when you use zero in math? you can't finish the equation. And so, to avoid that, we use Kelvin, because zero Kelvin is literally impossible on Earth. It might be possible elsewhere, but so far it hasn't happened here. We've gone within 0. 0.00001 Kelvin, which is really close, but we still haven't done it. Um, anyway, that being said, we have to use the Kelvin scale, and you'll see when we get to the other laws um, well, the gas laws um, that you'll look at later, that we have to have the Kelvin system because in Celsius you can have a zero, right? You've heard zero degrees Celsius because if you go to Canada, it's not hard to get to zero degrees Celsius. That's 32 Fahrenheit. That's not that cold. Um, and so, anyway, that's why we have to use Kelvin. Let's see if there's anything else you need to know with that. No, that's good. So please now do part three.
All right, part three, we're almost done. Sister's been sitting here the whole time learning chemistry. So cool, even my cats are learning chemistry. Well, sister, brother, not so much. He gets distracted easily. Okay, sorry, do you wanna say hi one more time? Here's sister, say hi. Hi, sis, can you wave? Oh, no, she's just gonna sit on my lap. Okay, third part, gas pressure. So, so, so cool. If you're wondering why Ms. Henius's Cheetos bag did what it did, you're gonna find out, okay? So what is it? It is not that feeling you get when you, you know, have to fart. No, 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 that's not cast pressure. Well, kind of. Anyway, what is it? Result of simultaneous collisions of billions and billions of gas molecules. Literally, as they hit into each other, and they're having that constant random rebounding, as it's happening, we can actually measure the force at which that's occurring, and that's gas pressure, okay? Well, what if we have no molecules? Particles. Keyword, particles. What if we don't have any particles? Can you have collisions if you don't have particles? No. Okay. Can you have pressure if there's no collisions? No. So what am I going to call that? What are we going to call no particles, no collisions, no pressure? That's a vacuum, not a Hoover, not a Dyson, a vacuum. That's for those of you that have to vacuum it up and you'll get that joke. Anyway, all right. Well, air actually exerts pressure on Earth because of gravity. Hooray for gravity. Thank you, Isaac Newton. Because gravity holds air particles in the atmosphere. If we didn't have gravity holding a, a nice atmosphere, excuse me, a nice layer of air particles around our planet, we wouldn't have an atmosphere. Um, so what is atmospheric pressure? Collisions of air molecules with objects. So as the particles hit me, hit my head, hit my cat, hit my chair, whatever, hit the buildings, that is how we we can actually measure the pressure at which that's hitting. And we call that atmospheric pressure. Um, what measures atmospheric pressure? A barometer. Okay, And um, it varies based on weather. That's why the weather person, whoever's reporting it, can look at the barometer and see, oh, whatever pressure system's coming in, they can actually see the barometer drop or raise and tell what's going to happen. Um, atmospheric pressure at sea level, one atmosphere, that's what the ATM stands for, is atmospheres. Okay? Um, but we can have different units. The same way that we can have one foot equals 12 inches equals a third of a yard that same idea where we use those conversion factors, that's why we started with dimensional analysis, um, is we have these three different units for pressure that we're going to use. One atmosphere equals 101 kPa, little k, big P, little a, kilopascals. We'll get more into that later. Um, so one ATM, 101.3 kPa, and 760 millimeters of mercury. That's kind of the old school way to do it. If you go to um, a college, that has like an older science lab um, or has like the remnants of one, you will see this thing on the wall that's like a giant ruler, it looks like, or a giant next to a giant thermometer. And it actually is full of mercury that will rise and fall based on um, atmospheric pressure. Some people will call it barometric pressure because it's the barometer that's measuring it. Same difference. Um, there's other units of pressure, and you may have heard of them before. Like if you go paintballing, that's measured in PSI. Um, and then there's this last thing called standard temperature and pressure. And what standard temperature and pressure is, if you're doing um, an experiment, whether you're here or in Thailand or in Finland or wherever you are in the world, if you say standard temperature and pressure, they're going to know what you mean. And standard temperature and pressure is zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. Hopefully you're done with part three, and I will talk to you later. Thanks. <laughs>